Now, in response to the huge increase of prisoners from Gettysburg to Vicksburg and the stoppage of the Dix Hill Cartel, General Sheff will apply and get permission from General Halleck in Washington to raise a company. This is a company of what was known as galvanized Yankees. Has anyone ever heard that term before? Okay. A galvanized Yankee was a Confederate prisoner who was given the opportunity to what they called swallow the yellow dog, take that oath of allegiance. Yeah. That was, that was not supposed to be a good thing. But these 148 men will take that oath of allegiance and become federal soldiers. Yeah. A good portion of them were from Gettysburg, but some of them were from those other battles I told you about, Champion Hill and Big Black River Bridge. And on July 27th of 1863, these 148 Confederate soldiers will take the oath of allegiance and their purpose, according to the party line, was that we need people that can fire these artillery pieces out here. Let me tell you a secret. It had nothing to do with firing those artillery pieces. It had to do, we need more guards. And they were asked to guard some of the same men that they had served with and been captured with and now they are going to be the federal soldiers guarding them. Now, these men are mustered in for three years of the war, so if the war had gone on for 10 years, even though the Confederate soldiers would have gone home, they would have still been in the federal service. And this unit is officially known as the 1st Delaware Heavy Artillery. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the only group that I have ever come across in Delaware that did not have a single person from Delaware in the unit. Mm -hmm. Now, it's also known by its commander's name. The commander was Captain George Washington All, or All's Battery. So, if you go out there asking about All's Battery, you'll, you'll find out some very interesting things about them. Um, back to the Confederate soldiers. Their meals are being served twice a day. Once at 11 a.m. Imagine waiting until 11 to have breakfast. And dinner was at 4. No lunch. Just those two meals. In 1864, they did not have a nice meal like we had today. Their meal consisted of three crackers, a piece of beef, and maybe a half a cup of coffee. Don't worry, dinner's coming. Three crackers, a piece of pork, and half a cup of soup. I don't know about you, and I'm, I, I know I haven't missed many meals, but I don't think I could subside on that. But the mess hall will hold about a thousand men, so they're eating in shifts, and it's not like we come in and we sit down at the table. They had tables, but there was no place to sit. You stood in front of a place that had a portion. You would uh, eat, either eat it right there, or you would take your handkerchief and you would put it all in that handkerchief and put it in your pocket. And this caused some of the Confederate soldiers, the prisoners, to try a thing known as flanking. Flanking is known as you would scrape up that food, put it in your pocket, scurry out the exit, because there would be one, one way in and one way out. When you got out the door, you would hope that there wasn't a federal soldier that was guarding the entrance, and maybe you could slip back in line, and you could come back in and get a second helping. Well, you, you were pressing your luck. If you got caught, what they would do is they would take your two thumbs, and you would hold them up like this, and they would tie them, and they would take that rope after they took it into the sally port, and they would throw it over one of the beams, and they would pull it up until you were standing on your toes. And there was no rhyme or reason as to how long you would be there. It'd be whenever they decided to let you go. Many a report came back 
that men suffer permanent damage to their thumbs from being hung up like that. Now, when the prisoners are not eating or reporting for roll call, they'd be spending time in the common area, or what was known as the bullpen. Because after all, they don't have much freedom, but they sure do have a lot of free time. The prisoner did have an option to work. That was, what was one of the things that was different at Fort Delaware. For instance, a man could earn 75 cents a day digging ditches. A carpenter, he can make 25 cents a day. Some of the soldiers were used just as laborers. Uh, and in fact, the chapel that was actually built on the island in September 12th of 1863 was built totally by Confederate labor. And they weren't always paid in money. Sometimes they were paid by giving them tobacco or something like that. Now, one of the most famous political prisoners that was out there was the man by the name of Reverend Isaac Handy. Isaac Handy came late 63, early 64. He had been invited to Port Penn to give a sermon, and he arrived early in the week, and about Wednesday, they decided that the church was going to have a little social to, you know, introduce Reverend Handy to the rest of the people, and they had it over in Delaware City. Well, during the course of events, someone asked Reverend Handy, what did he think of Abraham Lincoln? We are in mixed company, so I will not tell you what he said, but Reverend Handy was responsible for some of the religious services that took place over at the island because after his disparaging remarks, he was invited to be an all-expense-paid trip to Fort Delaware. Now these religious services, they became kind of common after the men from Gettysburg had arrived. And it used to be that they started holding them every Sunday. Well, it was only two weeks later, they started being held on both Wednesday and Sunday. And it was a very short time after that that they were then being held every single day and night. So, by September of 64, there's a smallpox epidemic that has hit the island. Probably one of the big ones. 169 deaths recorded for August and over 327 for September. The average death rate for uh, Fort Delaware was about 3%. The dead, once they expired, their bodies were taken to the dead house, which was on the north end of the island. And there were men that were making boxes almost continuously. When someone would pass away, they would take the bodies, they would put them in the boxes, they would nail them shut, they would load them onto a, a boat, and then they would row them over to the New, New Jersey side here, to, was it Finn's Point's right behind me? And that's where there's almost 3,000 Confederate prisoners were then interred. By 1864, the prisoner population has pretty much leveled out at about 9,000, until suddenly it ballooned to 16,000. The exchange program is still not in place, and scurvy has now replaced smallpox. By February of 65, the Dix Hill Cartel is really not back into operation. It's more on a small scale. There's probably about a little over a thousand men that were exchanged. Um, mostly these are POWs that could be released because they've decided, you know, I've had enough. I'm going to take the oath and be done with all of this. Well, by April 3rd, the telegraph office in Delaware City, the lines are singing with the news that Richmond has fallen. General Sheff has decided that he's going to order a 156-gun salute, and they will be all fired at about 7 o'clock. So imagine that you're one of those Confederate prisoners out there, 
and you hear all these cannons going off, not only would your head turn, you'd gasp, but you're wondering, what the heck is going on? Are we under attack? Well, the dispatch was taken out and it was read in every single division that Richmond had fallen. It's only a week later, another telegram comes in <coughs> announcing that Lee has surrendered. Chef decides to order a 225-gun salute and they will be fired at intervals throughout the day. On April 15th at 8 a.m., a telegram comes in and it is delivering the news that Lincoln had been assassinated. Chef ordered the garrison to be on alert and he had the flag lowered to half staff. That ship, the Osceola I was telling you about, well, I had a deckhand that made the mistake of saying some disparaging words about Abraham Lincoln. He was arrested, he was taken to Chef's office, and after hearing the remarks, Chef was in such a fit that he walked across the room and slapped the guy right across the man, right across the mouth. Chef then ordered that the man's head be shaved, which was a sign of dishonor, had him placed in honor, and then rode by two African Americans over to the Delaware City side. By May of 1865, this is after the war has already ended, there's still over 8,000 POWs who are holding steadfast and have decided I'm not signing that oath of allegiance. Well, by May 8th, the U.S. government has declared that all POWs below the rank of colonel are to be released. The government will take the responsibility for their transportation, and Captain Clark is having one heck of a time trying to arrange transportation for all of these individuals. Some waited, some had just run out of patience, and they weren't waiting any longer. By May 10th, Jefferson Davis was captured. When he was captured, his secretary, Burton Harrison, was sent to Fort Delaware. About the same time, even though, and remember, the war is over. How many people have read the book, I Rode with Stonewall? Anybody? It was written by a major, Henry Kidd Douglas. Henry Kidd Douglas, after the surrender of Lee's troops at Appomattox, will end up going home. He lived on the next uh, hill over from Shepherdstown, right across the Potomac. Well, there was an, a little, a, a young teenage girl who wanted to have her picture taken. And she thought that the Major looked so striking in his uniform. And she pleads with him that would he please put on his uniform and sit in the picture so that they could have their photograph taken. He puts his uniform on, he goes into the studio, they take the picture. The photographer was so enamored with this photograph that he decides to put it in his front window. Well, you can imagine what happens when Union soldiers come by and they start asking questions about who is this guy in the Confederate uniform? And oh, he put it on after the surrender. Well, that was a, an offense that could get you, once again, an all expense paid trip to Fort Delaware. And that is where he ended up. Later on, the only prisoner that is there was Burton Harrison. Kid Douglas had been sent home. General Wheeler had been sent home. Governor Lubbock from Texas had been sent home. So the only prisoner that is there on the island is Burton Harrison. So General Sheff and him struck up a friendship, and they got to be very good friends. And on January 15th of 1866, 
General Sheff was apologizing to Burton Harrison that, I'm sorry, but I'm being mustered out and I have to leave you here. Well, the next day, Burton Harrison was released. But just to show you how much of a friendship these two men had, on February 11th of 1877, Burton Harrison Sheff was born. So that's how much he looked up to Burton Harrison. So when you look out here at this fort, I don't want you to just think of the stone and the bricks and the mortar. I want you to think about all the men that served, sweated, some of them died at this installation. And I thank you for having me. Thank you.